So we next hear more about fMRI uh, uh, from Susan Tapert. And Susan is a professor in our department. I remember when she was a postdoc. And uh, she is the Associate Vice Chair for Academic Affairs, my boss in many ways, but I remember when you were a postdoc, who, <laughs> who is a, a wonderful organizer, a marvelous uh, contributor to the NCANDA and ABCD studies that we heard about yesterday from Sandy Brown. A prolific mentor and takes on with, I don't know where she finds the time, uh, uh, a large number of uh, postdoctoral students and fellows and does a bang up job with them. Well, anyway, it is an op absolute pleasure to have the opportunity of introducing her. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks for inviting me to participate in this. This has just been such a fantastic uh, couple of days to hear about everybody's work and to hear the kind of discussions and questions between folks. It's really a lot of fun. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent imaging work. Um, some not so recent necessarily, but I wanted to just go back in time for a minute and talk about how I came to be here. Um, I entered our Department of Psychiatry in 1993 in the joint doctoral program to work with Sandy Brown, and it was one of the best things I've ever done in my life, so I'm really glad that I made that decision. I stuck around and joined the T32 fellowship that John and Betty run now, but back then it was Mike Irwin running it, and in that postdoc time got to meet Mark Shuckett. We worked together on various projects, and I got to work with Mark on something he's been doing for about 20 years now called the Alcohol Medical Scholars Program, which takes junior faculty and maybe a postdoc here and there and shows us how to do things in our professional careers. And that has stuck with me to this day as very valuable how to write a review, give a lecture, do a poster, and it, it's been an incredibly valuable resource to many in our department. I got to meet Martin Paulus, and we've continued to collaborate on many projects, uh, which has been incredibly enriching and rewarding. Martin is an incredibly talented and creative thinker, um, and I've benefited a lot from that. And in more recent years, I've been able to work with Terry Jernigan, Jay Geed when he came here, and with Bob Heaton who I work with in our academic affairs office in the department. And this has been a fantastic opportunity for me to learn how Bob does what he does. He is able to manage very unusual bureaucratic issues that come up with a great deal of ease. And I've, I've learned a lot from Bob. Um, and I've had the fantastic opportunity to mentor a lot of wonderful people in our department too, some of whom I'll be telling you about in a little bit. The themes in my research career have centered on a couple of topics, um, looking at typical adolescent brain development, the influence on the brain of repeated use of alcohol, cannabis, and other drugs, particularly in the adolescent and young adult years, and also kind of the flip side of that, so looking at brain markers that are predictive of substance use later including looking at cure reactivity, uh, level of response to alcohol in, in coordination with Mark, and interoception uh, with Martin. And of recent use, I've been quite interested, as has Martin, in looking at screen media use in young people. It's a really big change in uh, society for youth. So uh, just a context of typical adolescent brain development. These are data that come from our multi-site in Canada study, and they're really very similar to what Jay Geed's work and other folks have shown over the years, in that over the adolescent years of life, gray matter is uh, refining and getting smaller. The cortical um, areas are getting thinner, and at the same time, the white matter is getting plumper and bigger as um, as myelin is occurring throughout the brain, especially in frontal and parietal areas. This is happening for boys and girls throughout the adolescent years and into young adulthood. And I've been really interested to look at the influence of alcohol and drugs at this time and how it influences these important neurodevelopmental stages. I've had a 16-year study that recruited typical middle, middle school students in the um, area here and did repeated imaging and neuropsychological testing with these kids over time. Some of them started to drink, some started to drink kind of heavily, and some started to use other substances. And the beauty of the design was that at time one, they, they hadn't been using. 
So we're able to compare their brain changes over time. And this is work led by Lindsay Squiglia, who is a grad student and a postdoc in our group. And she found that there was an accelerated uh, reduction in the gray matter over time in the kids who started to drink. And there was a flattening of the white matter growth over this time in the kids who started to drink heavily. We were able to replicate this finding in the NCANDA study, which is a larger five-site study that has over 800 youth in it. And here we, uh, in particular, replicated this gray matter finding where we see that young people who start to drink fairly heavily show accelerated reduction in their gray matter over time. We've also looked at functional connectivity in young people who are heavy drinkers. And we've actually done a whole host of uh, fMRI studies, task fMRI studies, looking at how uh, substance users and non-users are different in a cross-sectional perspective and how this changes over time longitudinally. Um, I'm not going to go into all of those in the interest of time, but this is a nice study that shows how there seem to be some differences in young people who kind of start to drink fairly heavily. Here we're looking at 117 young people who started over a two-year period of time to drink moderately heavily, and we compared their functional connectivity to that of young people who remained very minimal to non-drinkers. And we had two main findings here. One is that the kids who started to drink more heavily, some are actually young adults and later uh, in their adolescence, they showed a weaker connectivity between their emotion network and their default mode network. A second finding here is that we see that Throughout the course of adolescence, the, the, we're kind of using an accelerated longitudinal design here where each person has two um, years of follow-up data and we have quite a wide age span. So kind of piecing all of that together, we can see that over time, your executive control network is strengthening. But for the kids who started to drink uh, moderately heavily, that strengthening didn't happen, especially in later adolescence and the early uh, young adulthood years. So kind of concerning thoughts about uh, you know, starting to drink at an at early age. Uh, cannabis use has been a major focus of our lab as well, and much of this research has been done by, by a lot of folks in, in our group. Uh, Joanna Jacobus has done a lot of work in this area uh, looking at brain functioning in young people who initiated heavy cannabis use. And this is some of Joanna's earlier work where she looked in particular at diffusion tensor imaging results in adolescents who were heavy cannabis users versus those who were not. And in her work here, she, she's looking at several risk factors in the brain of predicting increases in subsequent substance use. And she found that kids who had sort of less mature uh, white matter, as evidenced here in diffusion tensor imaging by lower fractional anisotropy, kind of less healthy white matter, uh, seemed to be at much more likely to use more substances in the subsequent years. She had a similar kind of a finding with regards to gray matter where less cortical thinning, which could be an indicator of less maturation, uh, was also associated with more cannabis use in particular in the subsequent years. And we've also been really interested in looking at recovery of uh, functioning in some of these kids who've been using alcohol and drugs heavily. A lot of this work was in collaboration with Sandy Brown. And in this particular study, uh, Joanna did arterial spin labeling, which is a magnetic resonance imaging technique that looks at cerebral blood flow. So we had this study where we have adolescent cannabis users uh, coming into the lab maybe three days since their last cannabis use. And then we're paying them money and doing a lot of urine drug screening, uh, telling them to stop using. So we were able to get uh, some kids to stop using cannabis and other substances for about a month. It was really hard to do. <laughs> I think a lot of them resumed use after, after this was done, unfortunately, although a lot of them reported a lot of benefits of stopping using, which was quite interesting. But in regards to their cerebral brain blood flow, there's a less happening, uh, there's a normalization of a reduction in cerebral blood flow that occurred during this 28 days of monitored abstinence. 
Uh, and just one more area I'd like to highlight is that there's been some changes in recent years in a whole range of youth behaviors, which is kind of interesting to note. Um, we see in particular, probably one of the biggest changes has been in the amount of screen time use in young people. So last year, a Pew survey found that about half of teens report being on online practically constantly, whereas just a few years ago, it was about a quarter of youth. And if you kind of look together at a kind of wider array of youth behaviors, there have been some other changes too in the past couple of decades. Uh, one you know, kind of positive change is if we look at lifetime drunkenness shown in red here, actually the, the prevalence of binge drinking has gone down a bit in recent years. Um, there's still a lot of kids drinking and those who do tend to do it a little more intensively, but overall there's a smaller proportion of kids who are drinking at this heavy rate. Um, there's also other things happening too, like fewer teens are getting a driver's license at the time they turn 16 in recent years. But at the same time, we have a lot more kids who are reporting playing video games or computer games for three hours or more per day, and many more, of course, who have a smartphone. If you look at a little bit lower base rate kinds of behaviors, we see a reduction in teen birth rate and juvenile arrest records. Uh, but we have seen some uh, survey data suggesting increases in rates of depression and some that suggest increased rates of suicidality. So there could be you know, this kind of shifting uh, array of behaviors in adolescence now where kids are a little more isolated, they're kind of staying at home on their own, they're interacting electronically, they may not be out scoring drugs, so that's probably good, but there may be some downsides to this shift as well. So we hope to address many of these kinds of changes in youth behaviors in the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study, which Sandy mentioned yesterday for those of you who are here. Um, this is a large study, a lot of activities happening right here at UCSD. Uh, the general design of ABCD is we have already recruited almost 12,000 9 to 10 year olds and these are kids recruited from 21 different sites around the United States. We used an epidemiological approach to try to bring in as representative of a sample as possible for representing the United States demography and we follow these kids for it'll be 10 or more years and so we've uh, already started some of these follow-ups now. We have really high follow-up rates so far, which is great. And the general design is we do imaging with these kids every two years in ABCD. So it's a, a lot of imaging data if you think about the, um, the hard drive for that. Uh, in between those years, we see the kids and their parent in person and do some other assessments. Each time we're doing cognitive assessments, interviews, collecting some bio samples. And then in the in-between points, we do some brief interviews uh, uh, by phone or, or over the um, like text to get a couple updates on uh, more recent behaviors. A beautiful thing about ABCD is you can take full advantage of it without doing any of the work. <laughs> you can download the data, you can apply for a kind of simple data use agreement, download the data and publish away. Um, and the second release just came out this week. So we now have follow-up data that you can include in your analyses. So to kind of wrap this up, uh, this is a kind of an emerging model of some of the work that we've been doing in our group, where if you look at uh, alcohol or other substance use in youth and the in initial after effects of that use that are probably an indicator of the intensity of the substance intake, consider that in the context of pre-existing factors. This sets into play different neurobiological processes which influence gray and white matter development and other important adolescent neurodevelopmental uh, uh, milestones, which in turn affects affect and cognition and young adult uh, outcomes. So uh, I'm really thrilled that with ABCD, we're gonna be able to delve into a lot more of these aspects and um, with greater statistical power. So I really want to take a moment here and just acknowledge some of the fantastic people in our lab and in the ABCD and in CANDA and my youth at risk studies who have made all of this work possible and really fun. And I wanna highlight three people in particular. Uh, Joanna Jacobus has led a great deal of the work that I reported on here. She's an assistant professor in our department. Uh, Cara Baggett is an assistant professor in our department and is really taking off with a lot of very innovative work in the um, mobile technology area, especially 
youth, screen time use, and developing interventions that might help kids with adolescent uh, substance abuse problems. And uh, Alejandro Morello, as well, is uh, hopefully joining any minute our faculty. And he's doing a lot of analyses in our NCANDA pro uh, project looking at youth depression and alcohol and, and the brain. And we're really excited to see what those uh, studies come out to look like. Fantastic UCSD collaborators. It's just, as folks have mentioned, such a collaborative department and been a wonderful environment to do this, this work and really excellent uh, trainees and research assistants as well. So thank you very much. That's just lovely. It, 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 fantastic study and fantastic group of studies. And